This is the only video covering the Computer Fundamentals Lecture 7 of the IES Information Technology course. This video will focus on networking and specifically communication and LANs. A network is defined as two or more computers linked together via cable or wireless connection. So what are the advantages of networking computers together? It may be to share hardware and thereby reduce costs. It would be expensive to have a printer connected to every computer in a single computer lab. It may also be to share data and or software and thereby increasing efficiency. A good example of this are the files stored in the R drive, the resources drive at IES. Staff can put files and free software in the shared space so that students can easily access them. The alternative would be to create a disk or other storage device that contained all the resources and giving it to all students at the beginning of each year. This would be inefficient and what would staff do if they wanted to update, change or add new files or software to this resource? Another disk would have to be created and handed out to students. This is just not efficient. A network also allows users to work together in ways that are otherwise impossible. Examples include email, online meetings, voice and video communications via the network like Skype, and even having others remotely view or control your computer like when teachers use LAN school in the computer labs at IES. So what is needed for a network to function properly? Each computer needs a way to connect to the network. This means some type of network interface controller or NIC must be installed. There needs to be some way of transferring the data between the computers and this method of communication is either by cables which can be copper wire or glass optical fibres or via some wireless medium such as Wi-Fi or even satellites. And finally, there needs to be an established set of rules which allow them to communicate with each other. This is known as a protocol, and it's useful to think of it like a language of communication. So here at IES, we have students who speak a variety of languages, but the agreed language of teaching is English. That's our protocol. The most common computer communication protocol is called TCP IP, and this will be discussed later. Most desktop computers come with a NIC, a network interface card or controller built into the motherboard. It's more than likely going to be a port that connects to a Category 5 unshielded twisted pair, or known as Cat5 UTP. These are the cables that are commonly blue, and you see them sticking out of the wall in most computer labs. The NIC controls the flow of data between the CPU and RAM and the network cable, which attaches to it. Wireless connections still have a NIC that sends and receives data. For a few years now, laptops have all had a wireless Wi-Fi NIC as standard. These are also present in tablets, smartphones, and even some desktop computers. If the computer you use doesn't have a wireless NIC, you can install one, or even connect one using a USB port. The amount of data that can be sent in a fixed time is known as its bandwidth. It's measured in bits per second. Don't get confused, not bytes per second. This is very important to remember. Therefore, one megabit per second is one million bits per second. Now bandwidth is not speed. Bandwidth is the potential transfer rate of the network. The speed of a network takes into consideration more than just how many bits can be sent. Bandwidth can be explained like this. Imagine you want to fill the child's pool. Consider the following three ways of filling it. One, a garden hose with the tap only just opened. Two, the same garden hose with the tap fully open. And three, a fire hose connected to the same water source as the garden hose and the tap fully open again. Clearly, it will take longer to fill the pool using the garden hose compared to the fire hose and the fully open garden hose will be quicker than the just open garden hose. So why is two quicker than one? Because the water is being sent faster. 
So why is 3 quicker than 2? The water is being sent at the same rate, but the fire hose allows more water to be sent. So the bandwidth of the fire hose is greater than the bandwidth of the garden hose. As I mentioned earlier, the blue cables that you see in most computer labs is unshielded twisted pair, but the images show here that the copper wires are inside plastic and the group of wires that make up the cable are inside another sheath. Plastic does not shield the wires from magnetic fields or other interference, but just keeps the wires separate. Data sent along a copper wire is generally sent as an analog signal and therefore the digital data in the computer must be converted into an analog signal before being transmitted. Watch this uh, the short video on the difference between UTP and other types of cables referenced in the description below the video. Fiber optic cables carry data digitally as pulses of light carry down incredibly thin glass strands. They have a much higher bandwidth than copper wires and are less prone to interference from electrical or magnetic fields, but are much more expensive than copper. Optic fibres are used primarily as the backbone of a network. So for example, at IES, the computers in the labs are connected to a common point called a switch via CAT5 UTP. But the switches in each lab are connected via fibre optic cables to the rest of the network. This will be discussed later in the lectures. There's another short videos link in the description below this video which explains how the cables are made. The further the data travels along a cable, the weaker its signal strength becomes. This is known as attenuation. Therefore, in some networks where the cable distances are long, repeaters are needed to read the signal and then boost it again so that the data can keep traveling. Different communication media have different distances before they need repeating. The table shown here outlines some of the relative strengths and weaknesses of different types of communication media. UTP's biggest advantage is cost. It is cheap, but its bandwidth is relatively poor and its maximum distance is only fairly short. Fiber optic cable's biggest drawback is its cost, both in terms of the cable itself and also the equipment required to terminate and join cables. Wi-Fi, that is radio wave wireless media, can have a relatively high bandwidth, but most Wi-Fi network communication is done at a lower bandwidth than that of UTP, as it's cheaper to produce. Finally, satellite communication has a large maximum distance and bandwidth, but its disadvantages are that you need an uninterrupted line of sight between the sender and receiver, and the costs are very high. There's also the drawback that anything that gets in the line of sight of a microwave link for any period of time ends up the same as if it was put in a microwave oven for a period of time. This can be quite dangerous for humans and animals and therefore these links are often found on the roofs of buildings as there's less danger to people and most animals up there. Birds on the other hand aren't always so lucky. Bluetooth and Wi-Fi work with different frequency radio waves. Now Bluetooth has an effective range of about 10 meters while some Wi-Fi can work up to 100 meters. Now, these numbers are of course assuming that the radio waves can travel unimpeded through the air between the two devices. Buildings, walls and even trees can affect the range of these technologies and the strength and reliability of their signals. Another type of wireless technology is near field communications or NFC. The maximum transmission distance for this is only two, two to four centimetres, but we've put this technology to good use in many ways in our society. Our banks, transport systems, and even businesses who want to allow their customers entry to their premises, like a gym, use items with the NFC chips in them. Even the gaming industry uses them in console games like Lego Dimensions, Disney Infinity, Skylanders, and Nintendo Amiibo. We're placing a character on a specialist platform connected to your game console will allow you to play as or with the character you choose. 
The characters, like Yoshi shown here, have NFC chips embedded in them and the platform they're placed on reads the chips and sends the appropriate data to the console. Watch another short video by finding its link in the description below that explains how NFC chips work and how new smartphones have them built into them. So what are common types of networks? Well, here are four broad categories that networks fall into. Wireless personal area networks, local area networks or LANs, wide area networks or WANs, and of course, the mother of all networks, the internet. A WPAN is a network of interconnecting devices usually communicating via Bluetooth around an individual and their workspace. Common uses of WPANs are synchronizing fitness trackers and smartwatches to smartphones and playing music through Bluetooth speakers. Now the remainder of this lecture will look at LANs. A LAN links computers that are physically close together but as there are no hard and fast rules about what close together means, it is possible for an argument to be had over whether a network that spans two buildings or even two floors of a building is a LAN or a WAN, a wide area network. IES's network that now, now that it exists in two buildings separated by a reasonable distance is considered a WAN, but what would be the answer to the question is IES's network a WAN or a LAN if instead of Leichhardt Street, IES were able to build a new building right next door to the Boundary Street one? Would that be a LAN or a WAN then? It's a matter open for debate. A client server network is a common type of network in the business world. In this type of network, the server provides access to resources based on the user's login details, which must be entered before connecting the client, that is, a non-server device attached to the network, to the network. Now you often hear people talk about Ethernet. It's a protocol that allows the transportation of data on the given network. However, it's not the only protocol that exists. The strength of Ethernet protocol is that it works with other protocols to produce an effective network. Networks always look neat and ordered in their planning stages. The diagram shown here is a rough plan of some of the IES network. Take a bit of time to look at it and study it. These photos taken some time ago in the IES building show the ugly truth. It always looks neater in diagrammatic form than it does in real life. There are cables going literally everywhere. There are two important devices that are on most business networks. They are wireless access points or APs and switches. In home networks, these devices are often combined into a single device. A wireless AP is the point at which the wired and wireless parts of a network come together. Without the AP, you couldn't connect your wireless device to the client server network and you couldn't access the files and services provided by the servers. There are many APs around the IES buildings, but they all give you access to the one network. A switch is a device that not only provides a way to segment a large network into smaller pieces, but also improves the speed of the network by sending the data it receives from a sending or origin computer to the most appropriate switch in the network for the destination of the data. Without these installed, networks would become slow as the traffic would have to go to all parts of the network rather than be directed to the most appropriate next step on its journey. In addition, a switch will boost the data signal to stop it weakening. In a home network, a modem router can also act as a switch, as well as connecting to the internet and running as a wireless AP. This is possible because most home networks are small and it's more cost effective and simpler to buy a single device rather than three separate devices.